तो ये तो मैं चेयरमैन की तरफ से तो नहीं मगर एक व्यक्तिगत रूप से तो मैं चाहूंगी कि हमें संकल्प लेना चाहिए यहाँ पे जितने लोग आए हुए हैं और इस आ, इस बहस को भी आगे बढ़ाना और इस सवाल को भी आगे ले जाने के लिए खासतौर से विजय प्रताप जी को और हमारे बीच में और भी जो साथी सुभाष डोंगटे जी को मैं ज्यादा जोड़ना चाहूंगी कि अगर इन्होंने इस सवाल तो मुझे लगता है हम सब लोग को संकल्प लेकर यहाँ से उठना चाहिए कि इस विषय पर हम आगे बैठे और इस विषय को बढ़ाए और हम बातचीत के द्वारा सरकार और मणिपुर से संपर्क बनाए पूरे संचालन समिति विजय प्रताप जी को जोड़ना चाहते हैं उसमें संचालन समिति <laughs> तो ये है कि सभी को जोड़े और हम इस सवाल को आगे लेकर इस संकल्प के साथ हम ओके धन्यवाद अच्छा ये सवाल मैं आप लोगों से इस पर लेना चाहती हूँ जैसा सुभाष जी ने कहा कि संकल्प हम लेकर ही उठेंगे धन्यवाद बहुत सबका बहुत धन्यवाद मेरे ख्याल से मुद्दा ऐसा था कि इसलिए उसे निकल के अगले सेशन में इसलिए दिक्कत हो रही थी बट हमारा एक इसके अब दूसरा सेशन शुरू करते हैं जिसके लिए मैं ऋतु प्रिया जी को बुला डॉक्टर ऋतु प्रिया को बुलाना चाहूंगा जो कि उसको चेयर करेंगी और जिसकी ये सेशन है डेवलपिंग इकोलॉजिकल डेमोक्रेसी यानी कि हरित स्वराज परस्पेक्टिव पर और इसमें स्पीकर है मिस जारना पासन फ्रॉम फिनलैंड और मैं रितु जी को बुलाना चाहूंगा कि आगे इसको सेशन शुरू करें चलाना चाहे ऑर्गेनाइजर्स तो हम लोग ये करें जिसमें सब लोग अपना 
व्यू रखें कि उनको क्या लगता है इस पे क्या पर्सपेक्टिव हो सकता है इकोलॉजिकल डेमोक्रेसी पे तो और मत लगाए बिना आई वुड रिक्वेस्ट इफ आई दिस ब्रीफली इन टू लाइन वुड ट्रांसलेट वट आई सेड टू यू Uh, I was saying that the politics that we discussed in the previous session is something that's as relevant for ecological democracy. A lot of the uh, links with mainstream politics now is very clear with Copenhagen at the global level, with the various struggles on the ground in the country today at the India level between the Indian people and the state on issues of natural resources and their decision making. Uh, and it also links to the lifestyle in the way we live our lives and the way we are ready to change our lives. So those are the basic points I've highlighted and you would be initiating the discussion with the presentation that we have. Uh, the, uh, let me just introduce Yarna. She's a social scientist uh, from Finland who has also been a long time activist in the social and environment sphere, uh, been a member of the Friends of the Earth uh, Council for what Environment and uh, development in Finland, as well as a leading member of Vasudev Kutumkam Finland, which is a registered body there. Uh, and uh, Yana and Marco Ulvila have been uh, coming to India now for at least 10 years, are uh, uh, very well acquainted with the Indian movement scene as well. Uh, the publication that you will all have with you, if you've not got it already, uh, is an outcome of a piece of research that they have done in the last year. and. Yeah, I'm not going to be talking about that. Yes, okay. Uh, thank you, Ritu. And thank you. Should I sit? Can I? Do I have to sit? Oh, there you go. Uh, yes, so thank you, Ritu. And thank you, all the other organizers. And especially, I would like to thank Kamla Basin and uh, Deepthi Priya Mehra. Are they still here? No. Ah, yes, thanks. Well, anyway, it is not easy to a presentation after such a touching story, but I will try to do it. And like uh, Ritu said, these things are interconnected, so yeah. Uh, so I will here uh, present you the main themes of the book, me and Marco Olvila, uh, just completed almost one, one year ago. And I will speak here with the help of the slides. And uh, please do interrupt me if I'm not being very clear or, or, or yeah, if, you, or if you'd like to have some more details or something. But we'll have some time for discussion after this also. And Marco especially, please don't hesitate to interrupt if there is something you would like to add here, add here, because uh, this is really our joint work and not mine. So actually, I would like to have you here with me now. But let's try this, okay? <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Okay. So here is some basic info mm -hmm. information on our research project. So uh, our research was commissioned by the Ministry for Foreign Affairs of Finland and we had two researchers in Finland and two in India and some assistants in Kenya, Tanzania also. And our method was uh, having dialogues, a bit like this one, in six countries, Finland, India, Kenya, Nepal, Sweden and Tanzania. And then we invited some researchers, activists, politicians to share the thoughts on these issues. And yeah, from there we gained lots of in inspiration and facts for this book. And uh, yes, besides the dialogues, we, uh, we asked for around 20 background papers for our research. And there are some, uh, some are here in this copy, and some are found in the internet only. And this report was published in Okla this October, and yes, yeah. Uh, I'm not so used to kind of this uh, academic 
style of speaking, which I will now try here with all our fine, fine tables and so. So, uh, yeah, but anyhow, one reason why I will be now telling you about this research and showing all these slides is that uh, your feedback would be really useful to us as we are now uh, writing kind of a part two in Finnish for this book. And yeah, it would be helpful to develop these thoughts further. Okay, so the starting point for our study is the notion that we have multiple crises of the modern industrial society at hand. Uh, so there is too much pollution, and which causes climate chaos and overall toxi toxicity, and we are overusing uh, the resources on our planet. And which causes ecosystems destruction and biodiversity loss, and the, the economy, this uh, neoliberal market economy, which is now uh, reigning here on on the planet, is causing inequality, inequality and instability, and also uh, the loss of human dignity, which is. Uh, in some parts of the world, it, it means extreme poverty, or like we think in the in the Western world, we have a huge loss of meaning. So, which is a kind of poverty as as well. Meaning of what? Uh, meaning of life. Yeah. Uh, so, our basic argument, which proves the uh, need for change, is that uh, humanity is exceeding its uh, biocapacity. So, here is uh, a figure by the World Wide Fund, I think, which shows um, the humanity's ecological footprint that around uh, 1982 we have. Uh, we have exceed our environmental space or biocapacity and and thereby it's causing serious hard, hardship for future generations. So the more we use now of our environmental space, the less is there for future generations. So this is basically the reason we think why fundamental changes are needed. Is this mic okay? Yes, yes. Okay. okay. I would like to stand but there's no you can try that. Okay, yeah, maybe I will try that. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Oh, then I just try to be loud. Okay. Yeah. So to analyze this present crisis, we think we have, and and the need for change, we have uh, figured out two main principles which should be considered in all action and decision making, and these are ecological sustainability and human dignity. So if we had these two, the things would be uh, quite a lot better. And yeah, and applying these two principles, ecological sustainability and human dignity, we have uh, formulated three cultural classes, overconsuming class, sustainable class, and struggling class. And this is how we have done it. So here, yeah. Here we have, here you can see how the classes have been uh, formulated. So if, uh, if dignity principle is met and sustainability principles principle is met, then you are a member of a sustainable class. And if dignity principle is not met, but sustainability principle is met, then you belong to the struggling class. And if, if dignity principle is met, but uh, the sustainability, prin sustainability principle not, then you are in the over-consuming class. And then we have 
this fourth one also, morbidly overconsuming class, which we have uh, practically um, combined with the overconsuming class. So, yeah, basically, it's this through sustainable, struggling, and overconsuming class. So, in morbidly overconsuming, yeah. none of the two principles is met, right? Yeah, it is, yeah. non, it is non sustainable and non and completely dignified. non dignified. I yeah, guess. yeah, because it is just yeah. it's just over consuming in, in, in and human yeah. consumption kind of it, yeah. Okay. One go. And yeah. Here's some yeah. Some more de detailed info of the over consuming class. So our definition is that uh, in this class the annual per capita income is more than uh, 7,000 US dollars. And here you can see that the, this overconsuming class can be found all over the world. So not only in, in uh, Western industrialized countries, like in India, there are 122 million uh, overconsumers, which means 12% uh, of the population. And in Japan, uh, around the same, but that means 95% uh, of the population. So roughly, it is one third of the of the <coughs> population of the of the Earth. And here is the struggling class, and their definition is that uh, in the South, that means uh, uh, maximum two US <coughs> dollars per day or malnutrition. And in in the in the North, we have estimated it is about 5% of the population belongs to the struggling class. So this means, um, yeah. And here are the figures, how much is it in each country? Oh, yeah, I will have more, a better, better slide of this also, yeah. And then the rest, which means what, uh, what is between the over-consuming class, and the struggling class is the sustainable class. And, and in this class, the livelihoods and ways of life uh, provide for good life without exceeding environmental space. So, yeah, you are not really lacking anything. You, you have enough to eat and, and all the basic needs are fulfilled, but, but, but you are not consuming too much. And this is around one third as well. And here you can see it more clearly by regions. So if the red one is sustainable class, you can see it's uh, quite foundly. I, I, I thought in West Asia, North Africa, East Asia, Latin America, East Europe. But very little in, in North America, West Europe. the gender composition of the three cultural classes and I, I think this is the, the part of our analysis that have raised most, most questions by far so every time we, we show this slide uh, it, it raises lots of questions and even questioning uh, yeah so here we say that the uh, two-third of the people in the overconsuming class, they are male and only one-third are female. And in sustainable class, it's around half and half. And in struggling class, uh, the majority are female and one-third male. So the uh, first question is always that how come uh, women live more sustainably? And, and how can you say that it is uh, that men form two-thirds of the overconsuming class? And the, the most simple answer to this is that men have more money. And the bigger is your income, the, the more you consume and the more you uh, destroy the planet. Mm -hmm. And also even uh, we often think that, that a family is a, is a single so social economic unit. The lifestyles can differ inside the family actually uh, quite tremendously. 
and yeah, in Finland you can see this uh, if you are looking at the traffic, for instance. Uh, like in private cars, you can see there is one male sitting, and if you see a bus, there are around 45 female sitting there. So traffic is one example, and also uh, food habits. Uh, majority of the vegetarians are women, and so on. Yeah. And yeah, although these classes uh, I introduced, they are global. We thought that it's uh, also interesting to see uh, how how the, uh, the sustainability of countries, countrywise. Yes. And uh, here I show you two assessments: uh, Human e Development Index with ecological footprint, footprint, and the Happy Planet Index. Okay, so this picture here shows us the reality. So uh, this is what we want here. It's uh, as by uh, human no here. It's uh, human development. We want that to be as high as possible. And here's the ecological footprint, and it should be as low as possible. Um, Yeah, and this shows that there is only one country in the world which, which uh, has high human development but uh, does not exceed the world biocapacity available per person, and that is Cuba over there. Yeah, all the others have uh, either uh, too low human development index or the ecological footprint. Finland, you can see over there, the US next to Canada. So, not doing very well there. Yeah. Yeah, and the other one I would like to show you is a Happy Planet Index, which have been created by New Economics Foundation in the UK. And and yeah, the most interesting thing with human uh, happy planet index is that uh, it's the only assessment that's, that does not consider monetary wealth an, an important element in, in well-being. And yeah, it is basically combined with uh, this ecological footprint, which um, connects with our sustainability uh, principle. And then there's uh, this, uh, say, called happy life years, which combines uh, life satisfaction and life expectancy. Actually, it's uh, more complicated, but we have made it more simple here. So uh, when you combine this ecological footprint and happy life years, the outcome is that uh, Vanuatu, Colombia, Costa Rica, Dominica, and Panama are the winners. And yeah, this Happy Planet Index is uh, defined a measure of ecological efficiency of delivering human well-being. So it, ref it, it reflects the average years of happy life produced by a given nation per unit of planetary resources consumed. So if, if we combine this, uh, this outcome, Happy Planet Index and Ecological Food with, with Human Development Index, the winners are Cuba, Colombia, Costa Rica, and we have Sri Lanka uh, at number 10 in both. Yeah, but of course, these we shouldn't take too seriously because these assessments, they never, of course, can catch all the... <coughs> all the things, but it is interesting to see this because <coughs> usually you can see countries like like, like Finland there who should, be, who we should look up to and so, but yeah, it's interesting to see these countries for a while. Uh, okay. Okay. Up here, but 
the other main topic in our book is uh, economic, or how can we shift from growth imperative to more sustainable economics. And here you can see one uh, description of economy. It's a set of human and social activities and institution related to the production, distribution, exchange, and consumption of goods and services. Uh, yeah, and this description shows us that the economy uh, newspapers and all talk about now in the neoliberal world is actually, uh, it's only a very little part of the whole economy we would like to talk about, and which is here also. So, <coughs> Yeah, so in our book we call for a complete economy instead of, of economy that rolls along around this uh, GDP only. <coughs> and we are forming this complete economy with official economy, which is uh, private consumption and private investment, etc. And, and then we have this informal economy which is not part of the GDP, but we should be uh, there also. So then we have household gift economy, subsistence production for own use, gift economy and barter exchange, uh, legal non-recorded monetary exchange of goods and services, nature's free services, material commons, cultural commons, and even black economy. Yeah, and here in this figure we have a growth and environment, and there we see that the GDP is strongly related with environmental damage. So the higher the GDP, the, the bigger is the ecological footprint. So here we actually see that GDP is a brilliant indicator for environmental destruction. How do you conceptualize the Particularly the word footprint, how, how do we concept that? What is the concept? What is the concept? Uh, well, ecological footprint, like the bigger it is, like the more uh, resources of the, of the earth you are using, like uh, the capita. Yeah. This is a quantitative capital. Pardon? Yeah. yeah, so yeah, we have many times said that, that this uh, GDP is a lousy uh, indicator of anything, but now we have seen it, okay, it's a, there you can see how it destroys the, the nature. And Also, uh, growth and welfare, they, they don't really have a uh, correlation. So here you can see a figure from the United Kingdom. So the other one is GDP per capita. And down here you can see life, life satisfaction. So they don't really go hand in hand. Or, or until the 70s also in, uh, in European countries, they have gone hand in hand, but after that, yeah. And there's a quote from Robert Kennedy, who has already, I'm sorry, 68, said that that GDP uh, measures everything in short, except that which makes life worthwhile. And economic growth imperative is often reasoned. Uh, with the argument that growth reduces poverty, but here we see that uh, it really doesn't do that. And here's uh, uh, a research by New Economics Foundation, again, growth isn't working, where they say that global economic growth is an extremely inefficient way of achieving poverty reduction and is becoming even less effective. And during the 1990s, for each 60 cents to benefit the extreme poor, the world economy needed to grow $100. So, so yeah, actually here we can count that uh, if 
from $100, 60 cents goes to the extreme poor. We can see that $99.40 go to the rich then. Yeah, which means uh, multinationals and other. Here's a figure of uh, GDP and life expectancy. And uh, here we can see that only in, in its early stages does economic development boost life expectancy. Uh, here, it's national income per, per person. And yeah, with the, you can have quite the same life ex expectancy uh, around 70 years with quite uh, quite varied income level. So yeah, the, the same life ex expectancy can be reached with uh, relatively low GDP as well. So these don't really correlate either. So after this we can ask that, that who really needs this uh, economic growth. And we can say that it's the transnational capitalist class and not we or with the poor. So this growth imperative is it's, uh, only in their favor. And here's, here's one more example why growth isn't working. And growth uh, causes displacement and they <coughs> also as to poverty. And it has been counted that annually 10 million people are involuntarily displaced for dam construction, urban development, infrastructure, and natural resource extraction projects. For example, here in India, we have many examples. And up to 600 million displaced since 1950s. That means one for every three members of the over-consuming class. So, so actually we can think that if we want to uh, kind of raise people to the over-consuming class, uh, it's a traditional development. That means that one person needs to be displaced, development-induced displacement. Yeah, so here's our, our alternative to growth economy, <coughs> which is sustainable economy. So first we need to consider the complete economy, combining both official and unofficial economy. And we have to apply these two principles, human dignity for all, which means last person first, and environmental sustainability. And See scenarios. Uh, we have uh, described uh, different scenarios for all these classes. So, over-consuming class uh, needs <coughs> growth. So, no more growth. And uh, sustainable class needs uh, economic steady state or permanence. And struggling class needs empowerment. Okay, this hierarchy stuff. I will. But, yeah, so what we need it is cultural transformation to overcome this crisis. And we say that cultural transformation is possible. And, and for that, we need to arrest overconsumption. We need democratization and learn from indigenous worldview. And, okay, this development cooperation reorientation is. And here's uh, our example how cultural transformation is possible, you see. Like if we take, for example, trophy hunting, uh, long ago it was stylish and until recently uh, questionable, and at present it's forbidden. And the same is with smoking in public places or child abuse. And, and we are seeing that this change is also happening with excessive consumption. Like long ago it used to be only elite affair, and recently it was everyone's aspiration and right, and at present it's starting to be a bit questionable, the climate change and all. Um, yeah, 
consumption tax and the excessive consumption should be forbidden but no private palaces or, or airplanes anymore and space tourism which has now been much talked about should be forbidden and democratization we see that this universal actually keeps growing and none of the present systems we have here it's not really democratic uh, because it's always this representative democracy and the economy is not included there and that is the biggest problem that, uh, well, can you really have a democracy in capitalism and we need deepening and expanding of, of democracy Michael Moore, this uh, US uh, documentarist uh, said this nice quote that my alternative to capitalism is democracy. Yeah. And one way for a cultural transformation for the overconsuming class is learning from the indigenous worldview. And we see that so far it, uh, this indigenous system has been the only system we know that has produced sustainable culture. And because there life uh, is being sacred and there is gift economy permanence and this secret time yeah. and the meaning comes from giving much work and not consuming so and we see that these proposed changes they will either happen almost by themselves or Oh, and uh, by the efforts of the popular movements of the Lis and Van, it is uh, and Van classes, meaning the struggling classes. So, yeah, so what we need to do in the over consuming class, um, especially, is to uh, support the movements of the struggling classes, and, and that way it will have the change, we see. Yeah. So we need to enha enhance the power and resources of the struggling class, uh, right to food, vote, and information, and people's control over natural resources, and end violence against women, women, Dalits, indigenous people, and poor. And then reform is crucial as well. And, okay, this sustainable class, which is uh, in between the all consuming class and, and struggling class, that is the one we should uh, respect, protect, and promote. And yeah, and um, at, at the moment, the sustainable class is, is more. We, we see that okay, they are the ones that should be should would need a, a bit more development uh, to reach the overconsuming class. But that is of course the wrong way. We should see that uh, sustainable class is the role model for the rest of the world. And we are calling for a global mapping of such low energy consuming livelihoods and ways of life. So, yeah, and promote that way. Mm. Yeah, and here is the agenda for overconsuming for us once again. <coughs> is a shift to sustainable economy, undo the hierarchies, and we need the cultural transformation there. Oh yes, and here's one thank, thanks for Sustainable Futures Project Team. So thanks Petra, Ogis Kicha, Radeshpa, Shreda Anand from India. Okay, but thank you and uh, this is the book is free of charge. 
so you can everyone order the free copy if you like from this uh, email address so, uh, keo info at forming.fi so just you can write a request there and send your postal address and sometimes you might have it yes to hear your thoughts on this research and uh, yeah lastly I could say that the thing we have succeeded here we think that uh, by combining uh, this uh, questioning of, of development and uh, poverty reduction kind of uh, yeah here we, here we say that for poverty reduction economic growth is not needed or actually it is it is harmful. So that is the wrong way. Yeah, Marco, would you like to add to hear something now? No? Okay. So thank you. Thank you, Yana. Um, I'd open it to the house for questions now, but what is the can the organizers say? What is the time you would like before lunch, after lunch? Yeah, we can eat food before lunch, we can make roti for 15 minutes. So, tell us, it's 1 o'clock. It's 1 o'clock. It's 1 o'clock. It's 1 o'clock. 15 minutes more. It's 1 o'clock. 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 And do we need to have discussions afterwards? 15 minutes only afterwards. Okay. So, questions? Short questions can be answered now. And uh, observations can be After. afterwards. Okay. So any clarifications, any questions think, yeah. on Yana's presentation yeah. first? Yes, yeah. uh, Gautam Vora from Development Research and Action Group. Yeah, it's very clear that unsustainable lifestyles is causing the problem. And the capitalist model of development is the, is, is the thing to get rid of. But you haven't really been able to say how you strengthen the sustainable class. You know, you mentioned this cultural transformation. Let yeah. me finish this thought. This is one point. Yeah. The other thing you showed where the happiness index, etc., you pointed to Cuba being one which is probably the most sustainable, where happiness index is highest. You know, I'm a, a great admirer of uh, Castro and when he brought in the revolution, the equity issue was very strong and I think they're very close to equity. But the fact remains that the emigration continues and is still very high and people don't want to stay there. If the happiness index was high, then people would not be leaving that country and such. And the problem is basically a single crop economy. The whole focus has been um, uh, just sugar. And on that basis, there are any number of problems. And the, the whole country is now denuded of uh, talent, let alone the middle class. I'm not saying the middle class is necessary, but it is still an essential given. Have you looked at my last point? Have you looked at um, Bhutan, where they talk of the happiness development index? And where, you know, instead of GDP, instead of GDP, they go by the happiness development index. You are against GDP because you say growth leads to problems. Okay. But, you know, uh, your answers are not sustainable. Cuba certainly is not a happy place. But maybe you could have a look at. Um, Bhutan, where the happiness development index has been implemented and it's a very small population, but a relatively peaceful and happy country. Dr. D.P. Sarno, uh, I had been a professor of economics at um, Delhi University as well as in Yale. Uh, my question is related to the methodology of calculating those figures and some concept. For example, the concept of formal economics and non-formal or informal economics. Under the title of informal economics, you have included uh, economy, informal economy, you have, uh, which is not related to the calculation of GDP. So you have included a number of items, but Generally, economists, they do not calculate reckoning the, well, reckoning the GDP. 
you know, when we do cost benefit analysis, when social costs are <coughs> assumed for certain project, uh, particularly related to <coughs> have economic growth, when social uh, cost is for certain number of years in future is calculated, a certain kind of assumption is made. Here also I, I presume that there are some sort of assumptions when you calculate this informal economy. And that is, they are not universal. It depends upon the economist to economist particular number say. In that sense, how, what strategy you are going or you have already applied to calculate this kind of index for, for the informal economy? Promote Charla. The Copenhagen uh, climate uh, get together recent has been an utter failure and uh, I think it's basically because the economics <coughs> could not come to terms with the haves. Uh, in that context, what do you think we should be doing? I just want to say something. Yeah, yeah. What Gautam said more about Cuba, there are certain facts which I want to say. It was a single crop economy in the Cold War days. You know, there was a special arrangement with the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. Cuba was growing sugar. Uh, and Soviet Union also used to give fertilizers. But after the fall of Soviet Union, I think Cuban people uh, had to face a hard life due to economic... When we talk about Cuba, we should also think the whole picture in totality. That uh, they are facing the economic blockade, uh, the whole propaganda effect. So migration to from Cuba to US is, one should know what is the fact and the myth. But now, after the, the way that whole society coped with the fall of Soviet Union and coping with 